PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Welcome to PAC TV Community News. We have a great show for you tonight with stories from our communities. We're going to visit an Asian art exhibit in Duxbury, a story slam in Plymouth, and chase down a new food truck traveling in our towns. We'll also hear from the recycling director in Plymouth with some issues going on at the Manomet Transfer Station. PCN takes you to a ribbon cutting of a new dance location in Pembroke, and our health and wellness segment gives us some spice advice. We'll stop into a women's symposium sponsored by Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Plymouth, and we'll begin tonight with a boathouse restoration project in Kingston. The Community Preservation Committee in Kingston has set its sights on a pair of boathouses on the Jones River. Only a short while ago, these properties were in distress. But thanks to funding from the CPC, as well as the Jones River Landing, these historical gems are regaining their lost luster. We met with Peter Aronstam, who was tasked with doing the finish work. This project is a community preservation project. Uh, funding was provided by the town of Kingston to help restore these buildings. The Jones River Landing purchased this property in 2008 with the aid of the community preservation funds to come in and save these buildings. Extensive work had to be done. The foundation pilings had all collapsed, so new holes had to be dug about three or four feet down, posts put in, the new sills made, and the building had to be jacked up and set back down level. The Jones River Landing sees these properties and valuable for the community for three reasons. One, historic, of course. Uh, they're on, they are historic property where boats have been built for over a hundred years. They provide access to the river for education about the environment and they provide access to the river for recreation. Those are the three big components for the Jones River Landing um, and one of the reasons why we're restoring these buildings. For hundreds of years, from the 1700s on, ships have been built here in Kingston and these two buildings represent that long history. Uh, these two boathouses here so close to the river um, were not accidentally put here. They're very close because they were used for storage of boats and for boat building. The white building next to us was the owned by Nate Watson, a very well-known um, sailor and boat builder who built hundreds of boats here. This building was built in the 1940s. It was owned by Arthur Holmes of the Holmes family here in Kingston and was used as a storage building. Now that the structure of the building is secure, all the exterior work will have to happen. Uh, we put on a new roof, a red cedar shingle roof. The siding is white um, cedar clapboards. The windows, we're today painting windows, all new wooden windows custom made for the building. We've made doors, the big double doors at the end of the building that allow the boats to come in. And all the finish work and from the floor all the way up is, is what we're engaged in now. The importance of this and the end game for the restoration project is threefold really to save the historic fabric here in Kingston, that means these boat sheds, um, to keep alive the history of Kingston, two, to provide access to the river so that uh, people can enjoy it as a recreation and also to learn about the importance of the river system here in Kingston and Cape Cod Bay uh, and everywhere. Movement is a way we are all connected, and dance is a natural way to express movement. This philosophy is what makes up the Pembroke School of Performing Arts. They recently had a ribbon cutting on their new expanded location off Corporate Drive in Pembroke, and PCN stopped in to see more. They 
today we're having our official ceremony for grand opening and ribbon cutting for our studio. Um, we've relocated from um, Washington Street to Copper Park, so we've invited our dance family to come celebrate. We started in 1988, um, one studio, soon grew to two. Um, we have had amazing children come through our doors. Um, they've been studying ballet, tap, jazz, lyrical, going to conventions, going to competitions, sending them off to college. And uh, we got to the point where it was time to expand and ended up at Corporate Park, have beautiful studios, a multimedia, increased our staff, and here we are. We have multimedia in all the classrooms. We're able to um, bring performances to them that we might not be able to travel to. We're able to have online classes. We're able to bring some of the YouTube into the classroom. Uh, we also use it as a learning tool, so we're able to videotape our, our dances, our choreography, and then play it back instantly and make corrections and have that extra visual as a learning tool. And it's worked out really well. And our little ones seem to enjoy making music videos. Well, all our new spaces have um, sp sprung floors. Uh, both Studio One and Studio Two are wood sprung floors. And the upstairs studio, Studio Three, has a Marley floor. Um, we really wanted to make sure the kids had um, experiences on both types of floor. The Marley is often used at the college venues and at competitions. Um, the wood floors, the floors that we have here, are the same as Dancing with the Stars use. Um, and we just wanted them to be able to have experience on both types so that no matter where they went in the future, they weren't surprised by the surface and could continue to dance and, and be familiar with that aspect. Uh, we all have mirrors, floor to ceiling. Um, all our equipment in the studios is, you know, the stereos, the iPods, the, all of the internet part is in each an individual studio to have that many people in one room watching us at a time. Usually we don't, it wouldn't even fit all of us in the team. So it's really cool to have people be able to come watch us in the big studio. So that's pretty cool. Um, it has more studios, it's a lot more space. Well, that's good because we can spread out and do more dances instead of being like squished. We have three studios here and they're all bigger than the two, the biggest one in the old studio, which had only two. And the lobby, as I would say, double or triple the size. And um, at the old studio, we had bathrooms inside the studios, which was a problem. Uh, moms or teachers had to go to the bathroom. They had to come disturb our class. Now they're outside, which is a lot, very helpful. Well, we're thrilled to have you uh, at the picture. We worked with the Chamber of Commerce to set that up, and it's just our official announcement to the community that we're here. It's pretty nice that they came. It really is. It really is. We have a great community, um, and it's pretty large, but it's nice that um, other businesses and the officials um, have shared in our little success. That's good. In the past year, the Manimet Transfer Station underwent a facelift as they moved the recycling section to the top of the hill. This placement encourages residents to recycle before they arrive at the trash bins at the base of the hill on their way out. People have warmed up to the new shape of things, but there are still a couple of items that need to be sorted out. I met up with Solid Waste Manager Greg Smith to find out what problems still remain and how to fix them. So far, it's been a smooth transition as residents acclimate themselves to the new shape of the Manimet Transfer Station. They head up the hill, they go around the loop, they drop their recycles off in the indicated bins, but a couple of glaring problems remain. One of which is people not cleaning out their recycles before they throw them away. The issue that we're facing here at the Manimet Transfer Station is that we have two recycled streams. We have our mixed paper stream and our commingled stream, which is made up of our glass, plastics, and metals. And one of the problems that we're experiencing are that people are not cleaning out the glass and the plastic uh, containers that have food residue in them. And they're also mixing various contaminants in with our mixed paper. So I'd like to point out some of the contaminants that we're experiencing and uh, show uh, what needs to be removed from the waste stream. 
This is a mixed paper container, and in the mixed paper container, we primarily want to see brown paper bags, office paper, um, and light cardboard like you would have with cereal boxes. But if you look behind me here, you can see that we have lots of plastics and other contaminants in the recycling uh, stream. When the recycles get mixed and the transfer station delivers that container to the recycling manufacturer, it is possible that it will be rejected due to the contaminated mix. It would then be treated as a waste product instead at a significant cost to the Department of Public Works, something they're trying to avoid. So these are the types of materials that we do not want to see in our mixed paper container. Inside the co-mingle container, people have made the mistake of putting in plastic bags, plastic wrap, and plastic that is not numbered one through seven. We also see a lot of plastic uh, uh, food containers that come from your refrigerator that are not rinsed out and free of food residue, and that is problematic because it results in flies and vermin that we don't want to see at the transfer station. Then, of course, there are the items that people confuse as recyclables that are actually garbage. If we look here, we see a Rubbermaid washing basket. It is, does not have the symbol one through seven on it, so this is not a recyclable item. Same thing here, very, very common. We find these plastic bags that you would very often find with your water bottles in with the plastic um, uh, recycling stream, and this is not a recyclable item. It may, it, it's plastic, it may even have the number one through seven on it, but any kind of plastic bag at all is not recyclable and should not go in the bin. Here we have representative samples of some of the food residuals that we see uh, in our plastic containers. Again, not satisfactory. Um, again, another instance of a plastic um, item. It uh, does not have the number one through seven on it. We also see a lot of this metal. Uh, this is a metal item. It's not a steel or tin can. We have a steel recycling container to the back of the transfer station. That's where those items should go. Plastic shopping bags, a big no-no. We want no plastic shopping bags in with the recycling stream. And finally, we see a lot of food, uh, pet food bags like this. They feel like plastic, but they are not. They have a fiber weave in them. It is trash. So what we're looking for here in Plymouth is just the people to be a little bit more attentive to their recycling practices. Principally, if they would please not put plastic shopping bags or any kind of plastic bags in with the mixed paper or commingled, and please take the time to rinse out your plastic and steel and tin food containers of residual food waste. That would be very beneficial to the practices here at the transfer station. Reporting from the Manomet Transfer Station, I'm Brian Sullivan, PAC-TV Community News. Duxbury's Art Complex has two large exhibits a year, and this fall they welcomed Asian Connections, now showing through January. The collection includes over 1,450 works, which span more than 5,000 years. Many Asian countries are represented in the museum's collection, with a majority of objects coming from Japan, China, India, and Persia. PCN visited this amazing exhibit. So this is really an extraordinary opportunity to see the richness and, and variety of what we have in our own collection here at the museum. It's, a, it's an amazing collection. You can see three examples of our textiles, and those three, two of them are from China and one is from Japan. The one in the middle is a kabuki robe that is absolutely stunning, and then to the right of that is a Chinese emperor's robe that is embroidered with five clawed dragons, or dragons that each have five claws on each of their feet. And then the third robe is a Chinese female garment. This is a box made for containing the implements that you use for writing in Japan. So it has several brushes and it has an ink stone and a water dropper and it's absolutely exquisitely crafted out of black, black lacquer with gold and silver. And next to it is a document box. So this is a box created to store documents also made by the great lacquer craftsman Kohichi Tomita. Within our Asian collection, one of our great strengths is the Japanese tea ceremony. And Edith Weyerhaeuser, for example, felt that understanding Japanese culture was, was best approached through the tea ceremony. As a result, we have a large number of tea ceremony ceramic wares, and the most important one is this bowl here to the right. This is a tea bowl, 
and it was created by the man who invented Raku ware in Japan, and his name was Chojiro. And this is the only bowl that was made by Chojiro that anybody has anywhere outside of Japan. So that is one of the supreme masterpieces of our collection. It doesn't look that exciting, but uh, people who are enthusiastic about Japanese ceramics, in particular tea ceremony, just go absolutely crazy about this bowl. The oldest item in the exhibition is this ritual bronze vessel that was probably made around 1100 BCE, and it is a ritual bronze vessel cast in China. It's called a ding. It's a vessel used for warming meat. It's a cooking vessel, and it's decorated with an abstract animal mask on the front. You can see the, the ridge down the center, and then on either side of it you can see the eye and the C-shaped horn and the body of this uh, mythical beast, which was frequently used as a decorative motif on bronzes in China. It's a vase for flowers that would have been put on the wall within the tea ceremony room. Just a few flowers in it. And it has calligraphy written on it by a very famous Japanese calligrapher. So she actually made the vase and wrote the calligraphy on it. The exhibition will be on view until January 18th of 2015, and the museum hours are Wednesday through Sunday from 1 to 4. Downtown Plymouth literally got a taste of reality TV when the Foodzilla truck showed up with Paul Wahlberg, flipping burgers for the locals. Wahlberg is the owner of Wahlberger's Restaurant in Hingham and stars in the reality show with the same name. It was all part of a benefit concert that night, and not only did he make himself available for photos, he also took a little time to talk with PCN. So we're down here uh, doing um, in memory of Craig and doing this for uh, Johnny Alves, John, Johnny Drama, as everybody knows him. So we're down here doing this benefit and and really, you know, just making burgers for people and just trying to do a good thing. I know, me too. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Entourage and an even bigger fan of these burgers, so. It's really good. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> Tonight, the original Johnny Drama from Entourage and his band, the Funky Entourage, are performing a benefit for a young boy that just passed away about a year ago from an allergy. Uh, it's just to help get a headstone for the poor kid. You know what I mean? It's a shame the way he went out and growing up, you know, with Johnny and Mark Wahlberg and the families. Anything that has to do with community and kids, it's a big thing for us. Wahlberg is just in Hingham. A lot of people want to drive, beat the traffic, and get down to Hingham. So we brought a touch of Wahlbergers up here. I've been to Wahlbergers down in Hingham. They're awesome. And uh, even my kids, they love it. So I was so glad to see that Foodzilla was here. So. Second time trying? Yeah. It was the first time. At the restaurant. It was awesome. It's, a, it's my first Wahlberger. So I didn't have to go all the way to Hingham. I went to Foodzilla right here in downtown beautiful Plymouth. Come to Plymouth, America's hometown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my son is Christian Hatfield. He's a senior at Plymouth North High School. And he is in Northern Lights. He's also a fantastic singer and performer. And you will see him tonight. He is opening up for Johnny Drama and his funky entourage. It's amazing to see so many people from, from Plymouth, you know, rallying around, supporting the neighbors, and doing what's right. So I, I couldn't be, I'm so impressed, and I love Plymouth. There is a phenomenon taking off in the country and here in Massachusetts called story slams. People get up in front of an audience and compete in the art of telling stories. Modeled after the Moth Radio Hour on NPR, Mass Mouth began in 2008 and has brought this art form all over the state. Recently, Plymouth held the first South Shore Story Slam, and I personally had a great time while checking it out. 
I'm here in downtown Plymouth at the New World Tavern for the very first Plymouth area Mass Mouth Story Slam. We're going to meet up with co-founder of Mass Mouth, Andrea Lovett, to hear more about what is a Story Slam. I am a storyteller and I am half of what is called Mass Mouth. I'm a co-founder and Mass Mouth is a 501c3 promoting storytelling in all its art forms through social media, education and live performance. Tonight here at the New World Tavern we're going to have live performance with a story slam. What is a story slam? A story slam is a contest of words, how well a story is crafted. And tonight this, we have a theme called Terrified. It'll be five minute true stories on the theme Terrified. People from the audience will come up, drop their names in the hat, for a chance to possibly tell in front of a full house. Tonight we are sold out. So I want to tell you a story about a time that I was terrified. And without giving away the punchline, I'll tell you it was an irrational terror. <clears throat> a couple of days later, he emailed me. And he said, you know, we're still casting for this part. And so I said, all right. And I figured if it was good enough for Alan all that it was good enough for me. Between the ages of uh, three and seven, I suffered from a sleep disorder called night terrors. You, you're not really awake, you're not really asleep, but you start screaming. So I managed to get on board the plane, I sit down, plane takes off, I'm terrified. Grandmothers, not what you normally think of when you think of the word terrifying. Around 98, my dad lived at the end of Mass Road. And Mass Road happens to be one of the oldest dirt roads in Plymouth as, as far as uh, what, I've, what I've read and what I've known. And I'm wondering if in the dark, the spider people are still there. Thank you. Story slams often invite a local group to entertain during breaks, and Colonial Lantern Tours told some of their ghost and legend tales at the Plymouth Slam. Well, Captain Barrows makes a decision to leave his ship out in the open waters to ride out those huge waves. Captain McKee makes a mistake, is as he brings his ship into Plymouth Harbor, it runs aground out of White's Flats. And there are 106 men on board, and they are freezing and dying on the ship. He described it as an ice-cold energy that went into his gut and out his back. He got violently ill. He threw up right there at Burial Hill, and he had to leave the tour. We have judges. They judge on the content of the story, the connection with the theme, and the connection to the audience. If you are that good, you will win and move on to the semifinals. And if you are that good, you will move on to Mass Mouse Finals, which is in April at Coolidge Corner Theater. Good luck. So I take my tennis racket and I whack the ball. And you know what happens? It was perfectly in, and I score the last point I made. <laughs> Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Plymouth hosted a women's health symposium entitled Lessons to Live By for a Better You. The symposium featured female physicians from BID and best-selling author Kelly Corrigan. The event celebrated the BID's Breast Center's five years of service. PCN attended and met some of the speakers. Tonight's Women's Health Symposium was um formed because we wanted to empower women on women's health issues. There are many issues out there that women aren't sure uh, where to go for answers and we feel that Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital Plymouth has experts in the field and we want to make sure that our community is well aware of our experts and to be able to give back to our community. As a breast surgeon, my job tonight at the symposium is to talk to people about their risk factors for developing breast cancer. And there's a lot of them. Every time a woman comes into my office, I ask them a list of things. I ask them about their family history. I ask about risk factors in my office every day of my job. But the truth of the matter, only three risk factors matter. Are you a woman? Do you have breasts? Are you getting older? One in eight of us get breast cancer with those three factors alone. So that means all of us are at risk. What do you have to do? 
you need to get your mammograms every year starting at the age of 40. Really frankly, likes nothing better than when she calls a party for one. <laughs> I love being in a room of cancer survivors. When you reflect on a crisis, whether it's cancer or a financial crisis or losing your job, uh, over time, you know, you can pull out certain wisdoms that can guide you as you go forward. Tonight I'll be speaking to the crowd regarding emotional health, which is a broad topic that I feel is under-acknowledged and managed in primary care. I think there's been a stigma with mood disorders. I think we're afraid to acknowledge them because it seems like a source of weakness. And I think acknowledging a mood disorder leads to managing your life and living your life to the fullest once you've identified it and sought treatment. I am here to inject a little levity, I think. I have a talk on what's new for women at each decade of their life. And I think some of those are serious health problems with new answers to them. And some of them are the same old health problems that it's useful to acknowledge. And then he has to have him out, right? He sits there at the table. I hope that they come away with an idea like, that was a small piece of information, but it's gonna change my life because these are tips that I, are out there, but to hear the data behind them and the value of them and to consider it in the context of your own health and symptoms and those of your family, I think is really powerful. Our health and wellness segment brings us to Healthy Appetites in Plymouth to hear about the benefits of a spice we likely all have in our cupboards. I'm Jeff Hills from Healthy Appetites. This is the PCN Health and Wellness segment. Americans spend $2.6 billion every year on over-the-counter pain medications. We spend another $14 billion on pharmaceutical pain relievers. The most popular class of over-the-counter pain medications would be the NSAIDs. That would include aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. The problem with these is they cause stomach bleeding and they can cause ulcers. The problem with the alternative to those, which would be acetaminophen, is that it causes liver damage. But there is a pain reliever that won't cause bleeding, and that's actually good for your liver. And that would be turmeric and its derivative curcumin. Turmeric and its derivative curcumin have been shown to prevent other things too. They work on osteoarthritis, they work on rheumatoid arthritis, just like the NSAIDs do, but they also help prevent Alzheimer's. It's been shown that the Indian population has 1 45th of the incidence of Alzheimer's that we have here in America, and research has attributed that to the amount of turmeric that is in the Indian diet since curry is the national dish, and that's the spice that makes curry work. And more recent research has shown that it also works perhaps as well as medications do for depression. Now, it also helps prevent the onset of diabetes. It's used for the prevention and treatment of several different types of cancer. And recent research has shown that it may actually work to help prevent the side effects of radiation therapy and chemotherapy. As I mentioned before, the NSAID medications can damage your digestive tract. Turmeric and curcumin has been shown to be effective to help treat inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So you've got the option to do a medication that's not gonna hurt your stomach, not gonna hurt your liver, and maybe have a lot of good side benefits instead of side effects. Thanks for watching this week's show. Replay times are listed on our website, pactv.org, or you can catch us on YouTube by searching for the PACTV Community News Channel. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter to receive previews and links to all of our stories. That's it for this week's show, and we'll be back next week for another edition of PCN, so see you then.